Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Canadian Rec. This is Jamie Gray. This pod, we welcome Derek Daypuck. Derek played center for Canada. He had 17 caps. He was at the 2007 Rugby World Cup with Canada. Long-serving member of the Ontario Blues. Played for Canada at 36 at the IRB. And he's uh, currently a firefighter in Hamilton. Derek is coming up shortly. Before we get to Derek, just a little plug. Contact us, uh, social media, we're on Twitter, at Canadian Rock, Instagram, the underscore Canadian underscore Rock, Facebook, at the Canadian Rock, and our email is CanadianRock at gmail.com. We also have our website, the CanadianRock.weebly.com, and that hosts all our contents, contact information, uh, still shots of me and the guests, a uh, great place to go to if you need to find uh, information. Uh, just remember too, if you're uh, watching on YouTube, make sure you follow and subscribe. If you're listening on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, or CastBox, make sure that you're following and subscribing and also sharing. Make sure that you share these messages out so that other people can hear these great rugby stories from some of these uh, blessed Canadian athletes who have done wonders for the game of rugby for our country. In rugby news, uh, take a look at some local stuff. Canadian women set to open the Rugby World Cup in 2021. Uh, their first game is against the Asian qualifier. Pools are set. Schedules are set. Uh, so Canada's ranked third right now. As I said, their opening match is against the Asian qualifier. And that will be on Friday, September 17th in New Zealand. Canada then follows that up. Uh, their next game is against the sixth ranked U.S. on Wednesday, September 22nd. And then Canada's last pool match will be against Europe 1 on Monday, September 27th. So all in all, they've got three games in like 10 days. That's, uh, that's going to be tough for the girls, but uh, we know that they can do it. Canada, though, hasn't been together since beating the Americans 19-0 and 52-27 at the Can-Am Series back in November of 2019 in California. Uh, the time before that, when they met the U.S. in the summer of 2019, the U.S. actually won. Many of the Canadians, as you know, have moved abroad to keep playing during the pandemic. Some are in England, some are in France, some are in New Zealand. We've had a few of those on, and it has been great to chat with them. But a lot of them are still home in Canada, uh, fitting their training around their day job. So we're, uh, we're all looking forward to that. We're keen on getting that Rugby World Cup going in September and can't wait to see the girls in action and, and kicking butt down in New Zealand. Still a local front. The Arrows are waiting not on where they can play this season. Naturally, COVID has thrown a wrench into the 21, uh, 2021 season with the Toronto Warriors. As it has been with North American sports, the NBA's Raptors are playing out of the U.S. this season. In the NHL, there's an all-Canadian division with no games between Canadian and U.S. teams. Uh, so the arrows are kind of at the mercy, I guess, as to what the local, provincial, and federal government agencies mandate. And the arrows have said that they're, uh, they're ready for whatever decision comes. Mark Winnicor, who's the arrows COO and GM, stated, we do have a fully formed plan B. We've been working with the league and partner teams. And we have a solid plan B that kind of piggybacks on another MLR city. But our first priority is to play in Canada. So we're going to give it as much time as we need to see if that can happen. And if it can't, then we'll revert to a U.S. spot for as long as we need to be there. As soon as we can come back to Canada, we'll come back to Canada. So Mark is pretty confident that even if we have to go to the, the arrows have to go to the states, I'm saying we. I'm not even in Toronto, but as soon as the if the arrows have to go to the states, as soon as they can come back to Canada, that they will come back to Canada. The move, though, even if it is temporary, is going to come at a huge financial strain. But it sounds though the arrows brass is ready and willing to commit to ensuring the arrows are ready for this year and beyond. So good on them. On the international side, Six Nations kicking off in a week. Uh, there's two matches on Saturday, February 6th. Italy v. France should be a simple win for France. England v. Scotland. Uh, I'd love to see the Scots pull one out here. And then on Sunday the 7th is their last match of the weekend, Wales v. Ireland. Uh, Wales have been sluggish since the 2019 Rugby World Cup, so I'm not really sure how this is going to play out. Italy, uh, Ireland's got an aging squad, um, but it should be an interesting game. They usually have pretty good matches. Uh, more international on the super rugby front, the Eritrea kicks off in a few weeks. I still struggle with that word. Uh, in my opinion, though, that competition was the best rugby competition in 2020. I found it more entertaining than the Tri-Nations and way better than the Six Nations. Uh, they're kicking off on Friday, February 26th with the Highlanders hosting four-time defending champs Crusaders. Saturday, February 27th sees the Hurricanes hosting the Blues and Friends of the Pod all Blacks captain Sam Kane and Lachlan Bozier's Chiefs 
their first game is on Friday, March 5th versus the Highlander. Can't wait for that to get started. Lots of rugby coming up soon. It's just, it's great. Gray area this week. Uh, who's winning the Six Nations? Who do you have? Can England repeat? Has France grown enough to take it to the next level? Does Ireland have anything left in the tank? Does Scotland have enough surprises up their sleeves? Can Wales get their game back on track? Can Italy? Well, can Italy compete at all? Anyway, let's hear your thoughts on who win the 26, uh, 2021 Six Nations. Hit us up on social media with your thoughts. Let's uh, let's see what everybody has to think about that. It'd be, uh, be nice to see what everybody's uh, future picks are for the Six Nations. Looking for some specialized printing? Don't look any further than Eastward Sales. They're up on Union Street in St. John, New Brunswick. Family-owned print shop with over 40 years of expertise. They specialize in wide format printing. So blueprints, posters, signs, banners, canvas. They get a fast turnaround, highly competitive prices. Check them out at eastwardsales.com. Ask for my buddy Coin. Coin owns and runs the print shop. Great rugby guy. Again, that's eastwardsales.com for all your print needs. Coming up now, though, we have Derek Daypuck. Canadian Rock would like to welcome Derek Daypuck, fan favorite, team favorite of a lot of Canada guys. I had a few Team Canada members, uh, Ray Barkwell in particular, pushing to have Derek on. So Derek's been uh, kind enough to uh, offer us some time and join us on the podcast. So Derek, welcome to the Canadian Rock. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so let's jump right in. You're you're raised in London, Ontario. It's one of my favorite Canadian cities. We've got relatives there, visited a few times. It's a beautiful spot. Talk to us, Derek. How did you become involved in rugby? Like high school, you played with the Blues, things like that. Like what was your pathway, your journey up towards the national team? Oh, we got to go way back here then. <laughs> um, yeah, well, for me, it was typical typical Canadian kid, you know, multi-sport athlete, primarily hockey. Uh, got into soccer when I was younger. I was actually playing up two years when I was four with my brother's six-year-old team because I was apparently pretty wired and run around and kick balls pretty easily. So uh, that kind of got into the door open for the ball sports. But um, yeah, I was into everything growing up. Karate, um, my family runs a dojo. So I was well involved in that, like from about eight or nine. Um, and I continued with that until I was about 20. So rugby was kind of on the back burner until high school out in Ontario. No, nobody really knows about it until you hit high school, except for now it's got a little, a little more popularity in the clubs with the minis and stuff, right? So um, I'd actually meant to play soccer when I hit high school because I was a big, big, big soccer and hockey guy. And um, grade nine went out and the team that I wanted to play for at Clark Road where my, my high school was kind of notoriously a tough school. and the soccer team was actually banned for that year due to red cards from the previous year. Wow. And, and some stuff went down. So they canceled the team and uh, they didn't have junior and senior rugby. So as you can imagine, coming in quite young, you're pretty petrified to, to even try it when everybody's, you know, at that time was OAC, which is like, they keep coming back for grade 14, 15, whatever it takes them. Right. So uh, there was some pretty tough guys on this team and, it wasn't until they kind of convinced me that, you know, we're not going to be at you. Like, we're going to be behind you, you know, like we got your back. Come on, we, you know, we'll, we'll look after you, right? So finally convinced me to go out. And at that point, Dale Burley was, was coaching there and he was a hooker for Canada. So uh, I went out and, um, geez, like never looked back. Just loved it. Loved everything about it. You know, as coming from a, a physical background with hockey, my, my type of play was not type – you know, of uh, Wayne Gretzky-esque. It was more of a, of a grinder. So I still scored goals, and, you know, I was extremely skilled, obviously, right? But uh, <laughs> every Canadian kid will say, I think. But, um, you know, I wasn't the smoothest skater or anything like that. So I was, I was a little more rough, and rugby just spoke to me huge. So um, I was a lifer from then on every single year in high school. And um, basically what turned me on to – trying to excel at it a little more it was my best friend mike davis at the time had made uh junior ontario under 17. we kind of were like real good friends through rugby and hockey and football at that time too for the for the school so seeing him do it kind of gave me the confidence that you know what maybe i could have a go at trying for ontario next year so um that's what i did and ended up making the U u19 team and uh when it came to the u20s it was um a trip to Ireland for the national team. If 
finally cracked that. So uh, it kind of just, it took off from there a little bit, but um, really like it's, and it, it goes to show like a lot of your podcasts, guys get involved through chance more than anything. Like they excel at things through chance. Um, even, even with my hockey journey, I, I had quit hockey actually when I was 16 to play soccer and I wanted to be a soccer player full time. And by late October, early November, I was begging my dad to sign me up for hockey and I was never going to play soccer ever again. So that's, it's just, and then I ended up playing junior hockey for another three years and won a championship there before rugby even was in the, in the forefront of my mind. So, um, yeah, so anyways, it was, it was kind of a, just a, a game of chance getting involved in rugby because a guy named Rob Wolfen did back in the day, he ended up going to the pride uh, after I did, but he was already in the team and uh, I, I didn't get in and he got injured. And then I got a call from John McMillan asking if I could go out West in two weeks to join the pride. And I said, heck yeah, I'm, I'm there. So I drove out West and the rest was history pretty much from there. But obviously there's a, there's a lot of uh, failure after that to get where you need to go. But that was the start of uh, heading on the right foot anyways with rugby. How long were you with the pride? So that was a two year stint for me. And then I got into the castaways, uh, castaway wanderers after that. And um, stayed out west for a decade, I think. So I went out there at 20 and came back at 30. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of great rugby in those two programs. Oh, man, yeah. It was, uh, even just just the pedigree before you, seeing who came through there, uh, guys like Kyle Nichols and Tatey. And, you know, like, it's just obviously everybody wanted to be there. And uh, it's actually qu quite awesome to see them rename it the Pride again when they when they started it up. and had this, the, the emblem and, you know, it, it kind of solidified a history and, you know, uh, a deep seated history for the guys that are there now. Yeah. And um, hopefully they kind of delve into that as well. I think so. I've been uh, chatting with Jamie Cudmore a fair bit. He's uh, asked me to kind of help a little bit with some alumni stuff and connecting people virtually kind of like this. So it's nice to hear you say that because those are some of the things that are right on the forefront of the burner to try and, mm -hmm. and keep that, you know, get spark that pride going and keep it strong and, and make it, uh, make it, I think what everybody wants it to be there. So yeah, that's, that's awesome that you bring that up. Yeah. Like I, it, it's, it's interesting to get a bunch of kids away from their families at that age into, into a full-time program, right? It's, it's tough. Um, guys are trying to make ends meet financially back then too. Um, at the, that time, David uh, Clark was running the program and uh, Beverly and they really ran it like a, like a family and made sure that, you know, everybody was taken care of. Hubby was kind of like the dad. I don't know if you ever heard any stories about Hubby, but Hubby was kind of like the grandpa dad out there looking after everybody, whatever they needed. And uh, you just felt like, you know, if, if you fell anywhere, somebody was there to pick you up. And I know uh, Jamie seems like a real hard, tough guy to a lot of people, but he's got a real big heart. And, he's a teddy bear. Um, he's, a, he's, well, he's a big family man too. And I know that he cares a lot about those kids. So I think they're all in the right hands. Yeah, I agree. That's that's going to be awesome. Let's let's jump back at you here. So you had a good cup of coffee with Canada. It's seven and seventeen caps, from my count. Yeah. Um, I, I don't even know where to go here. So you talked to us about the experience. I guess you started with Canada in the early two thousands. Right. Was there issues at that time with players leaving for pro contracts? Like how did, you know, the pro game was in its infancy at that time. Did a lot of Canada's talent take off? Did it make it harder for Canada to come together as a country, hosting some of those events, going to, like, you were at the 2007 uh, World Cup? How did, it, how did all that impact Canada in those early years of the 2000s when pro was just kind of beginning? It was, for those guys, to be honest, it was kind of an era where the guys that came just before me had a little bit of a tighter niche with them. But I think when we started coming in around that 2003 era, they were like almost like ghosts, like they were gone. And then they, you'd see them like maybe once or twice a year for games here and there, even if that, and then they're, they're gone again, right? So a lot of them, to be honest, you never even saw it until like a World Cup year. It was like three years before you saw somebody and then they'd fly in and next thing you know, they're in the team and then gone again, right? So um, being in the seven squad with the Commonwealth Games, you know, I got to play with Morgan and those guys when they came in, but um, we didn't really spend much time with them. It was, to be honest, it was the domestic guys grinding in and out. Um, the program for most of those tests in those days was predominantly domestic. 
players because the pros weren't released a lot of them right mm. so um yeah like for for the dynamic in the team it's definitely um it's interesting to say the least to have a, a core group and then have guys that come in that are like extremely professional obviously and care themselves in a certain way and you, you know they're probably looking at everybody like you know what's what's going on here i can't wait to see how you know these guys train or whatever so there's a it's just, it's just coming to the table full out uh, with your mind and ready to play is, is really only half the battle. But if that team doesn't gel, like you said, like um, there's a whole bunch of issues there as well, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so basically for the start for me, it was, it was sevens for a good year, I think, for 2003, 2004. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you kind of just buy your time after World Cup to – for those guys to kind of weed out where they start to cap a lot of new guys. It's kind of how it worked back in the day where now it seems like, you know, every year they're just, there's a bunch of guys getting caps here and there and um, trying to see whose feet get wet and who, who can handle it. And, you know, they go from there. So. Did you enjoy the sevens program when you were with them? Yeah. So I, I think I had about 20, 21, 22 tournaments ish. Um, and then uh, pre world cup in 2007, they, they, somewhat made guys choose um we i think t- to the program both ways we kind of lost you know a couple of solid people here and there just the whole experience in sevens is if you come out of you know canada where you're hoping to make the show for hockey and that's like that's going to be the biggest stage you might ever play on like as a high school final with 2000 people or whatever right and then all of a sudden your first tournament's hong kong it's it's quite the experience right yeah um you obviously know a lot of the players there uh, that you've looked up to forever, guys like Serevi and, you know, so you, you see people walk around or next thing you know, like you're at, you're at the dinner table and they're two over from you eating and just, you start to realize everybody kind of puts their shoes on the same way and they tie their laces the same way. And the, the starstruck uh, kind of situation goes away pretty quick, I guess, uh, when you're in, t- in training like the next day against Australia and, you know, you know that if you're getting laid up, you know, Sluggo's not going to be too pleased about it or whatever's happening, right? So um, we had some good leaders on the team too, with Marco Di Girolamo and guys that have kind of been around that really just kind of showed that we weren't going to take much off anybody and, you know, we were going to give it our all here and there and see what happens. So there was a lot of good guys to look up to and it was a kind of a smooth transition into it. Um, and obviously, like, just if, if that experience doesn't turn you on to – where you want to go, then nothing really will, you know? You're in the wrong game. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Sevens is very exciting to watch for sure. Um, let's jump back. You, you know, you talked a little bit about the, the pro- professional aspect in the early 2000s. Major League Rugby is now, it's, I think it's starting its fourth year. We get the Toronto Arrows. There's like 16 or 17 teams. How is that going to help, in your opinion, do you, how is that going to help Canada and USA, I guess, climb the rankings and become stronger rugby playing nations? I think it's it's huge. Um, I, obviously, you'd even like to see an, another Canadian team open up. Um, Vancouver, one in Halifax, maybe. Yeah, like it, it's it's kind of like uh, I kind of want to answer your question, but rewind a bit to the the Super League, maybe, where it was a great idea to to kind of springboard an elite level of rugby to what domestically like what we thought, right? Um, it got a lot more people involved. A lot more people are able to shine, put their hand up. It's great as a grassroots program. I think the more that you, you kind of diffuse the, the top talent amongst the teams, it brings the level down a bit. So it's great that right now we have as many guys as, as we can into the whole league. Um, I think, like, uh, obviously the, the talent coming into that league is getting better as well. So it's making the guys – uh, in Canada play a lot better to, to keep their spots as well. So that's all positive. Um, and I definitely like that right now there's one Canadian team to rally behind. So a lot of the Canadian guys kind of, you'd think would want to play for that team primarily. Um, some of the other teams obviously have a huge Canadian contingent where it's, it almost turns into like a home kind of situation for them, like especially the guys out in Seattle. Um, so that's great too. But I, but don't kid yourself. If there was a Vancouver team, you know they'd want to be playing for it instead, right? Like it's just, it's just how it is. Like you kind of, you have a maple leaf on your shoulder and your chest, and that's where it's at, you know. Yeah. So, uh, 
yeah, it's, I think it's awesome. I think for a guy like me, it kind of makes me a bit jealous, to be honest, you know, um, going through all those championships with the blues and then, uh, hearing about it for like the kind of like the last two years of where, where that program was going and getting pro teams trying to play us and, you know, things were just flying up and then thinking about having a family and getting old. I was getting old a long time before I was getting old to tell you the truth, but I was still kind of functional and, you know, had a place in the squad, which was great and able to kind of have a few old heads there too, that were able to keep the young guys in, on the same page and, you know, we had a big success. So seeing all them now jump into the pro situation is, it's, it's somewhat bittersweet because, you know, you, it's, you want to be there. You want to, you want to think, oh, I, that would have been awesome, you know, playing, playing in a pro league finally in Canada, right? So my hat goes off to all those guys. I think it's awesome for them and uh, it's awesome for the country. Yeah, I, I agree, though. The, the jealousy aspect comes and you just miss it by just a little bit, the window. A little right? bit, like, yeah. You're, you're a little bit younger than me, but uh, it's one of those things you think, I, I, can, I can do this for a year. I can lace them up for a year and you know, yeah. try it out. But it's going to be hard. Yeah, it's going to be hard for, you know, guys your age that play profession or play nationally and, you know, that league comes in. But you, I agree 100%. It's, it's hopefully going to do wonders for, the, uh, for our game over here for sure. Yep. So... That, let's go back to that 2007 Rugby World Cup in France. You had a draw, draw to Japan, losses to France, Fiji, and Wales. Talk to us, I guess, about your personal experience. Like, what were your expectations? Yeah, that's, a, that's kind of a loaded question, right? Like, there's a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of hype about a World Cup. And I think um, the bigger you make something, like, the bigger it becomes and the, the more, like, problematic it becomes where I think that team that we had going into that World Cup, we were, we were just starting to somewhat find our, our identity and peak kind of around the right time. Um, obviously, like, destroying the States every time we played them. And we were, we were in good spots against Japan, like, all the time winning those games and um, coming off wins against Argentina and stuff when, when Pichot and the group came into Calgary there. And the team was, was on a positive kind of foot and um the hype of it all uh you know who's who's going to be on these other teams the the dynamic there is uh is interesting to say the least and i think to be honest looking back at it it somewhat got the best of us and i think that world cup could have went a, probably one of the mo more positive ones out of any of the the recent ones where legitimately three of those games could have been won in my opinion um, and a lot of the guys that were there will probably tell you the same thing, you know. Um, if you look at the Japan game, that's, you know, not to go into details, but I think that's a surefire W right there. Um, and, and I'm sure a lot of the people have kind of remember that, and your viewers or have seen it. And maybe there's yeah. younger guys that haven't, and if they they haven't, maybe they should rewatch it because they're on YouTube. But, um, yeah, just like guys – playing really well even the Fiji game right on the door line uh the doorstep right at the end of the game ready to score and you know the score line doesn't dictate what actually happened in that game you know um so there that was a a good chance at a win there and then with Wales with 20 minutes left winning and everybody says you know like oh it's because they brought the pros on and you know they they took over the game and this or that where from watching it and knowing what we were trying to do we 100 percent went away from our game plan with 20 minutes left and started putting up high balls in the middle of the field on elite players and like just stuff that we knew we shouldn't do that we didn't do for the whole 60 before that. And then um, I think the team that was on the field that day, which I wasn't on the field, but the guys that were there had everything in the bag to, to make that turn into a win for sure. And we kind of just fell apart uh, on ourselves, to be honest. So um you throw three wins there and then the Australia game was pretty tight at half as well, um, which I was a part of that game. And I can tell you that the mood going into the second half is, was not up to par where uh, a team that knows and thinks they can win should be with the score being that tight. Yeah. So I think again, mentally, um, you kind of just let yourself down. 
and a lot of people will say, you know, well, 100%, you probably weren't coming out with a win there. You know, they could have brought on Gregan or blah, 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 right? Um, at the end of the day, every every single game starts off 0-0, zero, zero, um, and you kind of dictate where it goes from there, right? At least we could have kept that one tight, but, you know, there were some pretty high – high-ranking stars on that team too with Lai Takiri and Nasha Cooper and guys like that and so um you know three and one maybe coming out of the pool matches that would have been interesting to be honest if you're gonna be fair yeah but um to turn into like you know the, the tie and then three losses it kind of looks like a landslide the other way right yeah and then obviously the follow to that is heads roll and yada 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 right so um yeah, it's definitely interesting, and and the domino effect out of coming out of that World Cup was that interesting as well. We had an interesting mix of players, or you had the your Aaron Carpenters, your DTH Kleberger, those guys kind of young coming in, but you also had you said you mentioned earlier Morgan Williams, you had Broad Snow, so you had a good mix of players. It, but like you said, you know that last twenty against Wales, we just kind of got away from our game plan. Was it lethargy? Was it attrition? Like. I think, I think a lot of it, to tell you the truth, is mental toughness and attitude. Yeah. To, to be honest, yeah. And and uh, you know, I'm never one to name names, and I'd, not, I'd never throw anyone under the bus, so I'm not going to do that. But I can tell you for a fact that that team, if they would have had the same kind of mental mental toughness, and and I'm I'm not even saying that I had it either. Like I think I know where I've been later on in my career, and I was I definitely wasn't there then mentally yeah. and i know that if we, if we kind of had that aspect to our game who knows what would have happened and it's a huge huge part of the sport like percent and i i can tell you for sure like winning you know five in a row with the blues or whatever th- those guys worked on their mental game through trial and error yeah but there was definitely an overhanging kind of ambiance of of where our heads should be at and it was reiterated over and over again. And there wasn't a guy in that room, no matter what the score was, that didn't think we were going to win. Nice. You know, so it's, it, it helps huge. And, I, and if you, you know, I know you had Nate and those guys on too. And you don't win championships in Singapore or, you know, have all these top finishes against all the best teams in the world by just playing. You know, they know they can win. They think they can win. And it's not – they don't question that stuff on the fly, you know, where – I can tell you for sure in that World Cup, it was like, oh, you know, we're winning with, you know, 20 minutes left against Wales. Like that, I guarantee you that was in some guys' heads, you know, like a different gotta, mindset, right? You got to yeah. play it, you know, moment by moment. You can't get too far ahead of yourself, right? It, 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 well, honestly, honestly, just tune it, kind of just own your abilities as well, like, and know that you can do it just, yeah. just subconsciously. You know, it can't be something that you think about. We, we had a, a really good sevens team too be, kind of back in the day when we, we beat Fiji and Hong Kong and uh, during the professional era with uh, Marco as captain. And, you know, we had, a, we had a really, really solid team that believed in ourselves and we started to knock off top teams, started to knock off South Africa with, you know, all their stars, you know, Fabian Juries and all these guys that were like huge names back then. Yeah, our abilities, but also the fact that Sluggo got us to a point with um, – you know, some sports psychology guys coming in and get to the point where everybody knows they can win and, and they don't question it. It's just something that you just know. And um, that was lacking for sure in that 07 World Cup team yeah, across the board and, and per, myself probably included to more than others, you know? Well, you're right. The mental aspect is huge in, in sports now. It's come a long way. So for you to highlight that from you know, tournament 13 years ago, uh, no, geez, 17 years ago. No, wait. Yeah, 13 years of my math. I'm not a math teacher. I'm a history teacher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, no, that's, it's, it is key. It is very key. Um, so what did you do? So you coach Western Ontario Women's Program. How did you use those experience, the mental, the mental aspect that you talked about, and working with that game? Like, did you have intentions of staying in the game at the time? What did you use from your national experience to help these girls play? What were, what was you, what were you like as a coach? If I walked onto the field and you were coaching the men's program, what would I get out of you as a coach? Yeah, so um, coaching the women obviously is different than coaching the men. It just it just is. They're they have you know a, a different 
psyche all together. And I'm, and I heard Tady kind of talk about that too. When you had him on, that's a huge learning curve as a male coach in a, in women's sport to kind of figure out how people click. And I think you can, you can kind of paint a, a men's team with a broad brush of what they should be doing as a group and, and hope for the best, but you really, and this is one thing that I wish I had kind of done better when I was coaching the woman at Western is gain like an individual rapport with every single player individually to try to work them towards the goal as opposed to just, here's the plan. Um, I need you to cross the line and switch on, get it done. And then when you cross the line again, you can switch off. You know what I mean? Like that doesn't work. And that's something that I learned after coaching them. It's an interesting dynamic too over time. I'm, and I'm sure you've seen this as a teacher if you've been teaching for a while. 15 that, years, yeah. Yeah, so like the kids that came through when I first started coaching there like over a decade ago, um, you kind of, you see this move from a lot more mentally tough, less entitled people to a lot less mentally tough, more entitled people over the, over the course of that decade. And that's also something I didn't adjust to at all. And I wish I had, because I kind of felt like I didn't need to at that level. You know, it was, it was almost yeah. like, well, you know, you're all adults now. Um, you know, if, if you don't want to take this as serious as, you know, most of the people that are here, or me or whoever, like, I'm just, I just don't have time for you. Um, I think like in this era that, that also doesn't work and it's, and it's probably not fair either, you know? So I'll take that one on the chin too. Um, so like, if you're asking what type of coach I was, it was one that demanded that people bring their, their A game to every training session and, and not waste a rep and give it their best and just try. Like, I didn't care if your skills broke down, but if you didn't care and you're just here for a tracksuit, I really had no time for you. That's kind of the coach I am. Um, and if, if you're asking maybe like if I'd change that now, I don't know if I would. I, I think, think I would just to. make it, I would make it more clear what my expectations are maybe, yeah. but I don't think I would change that because I think the people that really did care and the people that needed to excel and move on like the, the page fairies and, you know, like girls that were there to play and move to the next level, I think got a lot more out of it. Like if you asked them what kind of coach I was, that maybe they'd say, you know, one that demanded that I'd come to training and play my best and I got a lot out of it, you know, maybe I'd hope she'd say something like that. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's a tough question, I think too. Like uh, a university athlete in 2020, I don't think is the same as university athlete in, you know, 2012 or 2005 or 1998 or 1970. And if you go back further, you're, I think you're going to get more of a, um, a responsible kind of adult mindset on how responsible they are personally mm -hmm. for their, their success and their training. Where I think um, the, the move now is the coaches that coach these athletes need to be a lot more hands-on to get a higher rate of success yeah. individually with each student. So, right. yeah, so the, it's, I don't know if, like, I think maybe that was part of the reason why I didn't go back to the program when I, when I had a chance, when they were mm -hmm. making some changes. It's just because I'm the first one to put my hand up if things aren't working out, maybe I'm the problem, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. That's kind of that was that kind of whole university story there. Um, Tom Dolezal, who is a, a Canadian prop, he's also coaching the men there, and so I help out with him when I can. Um, and uh, maybe the kind of coach that I am has a little bit more rapport with them. I guess you could say. Okay. I think I'm just a, I'm a little bit too uh, I'm a little bit too demanding of of just caring that you're there you know that's all that's all I really ask I need you to have full effort and just just want to be there because if you don't I have no time for you I don't think there's anything wrong with that Derek I think that's when your expectations are clearly set out that you want those players to give their all every time they're on the pitch it's not for you it's for their teammates because if they're not giving their all then why are their teammates going to want to give their all as well 
And yeah. that's, you know, it's not something to take personal as, as much as hard as it is, because as a coach, you do take things personally. Definitely. Yeah. But you want those players to be grinding out for each other, nobody else, but for each other. So, yeah, I, I don't really see anything wrong with that. I agree. Like maybe expectations weren't clear or something like that, but definitely you want those players that are going to give their all every time they're on the pitch, whether it's training, whether it's in the weight room, whether it's a game. So. Yeah. Like the interesting part about that is if you rewind like four or five years, even, the, the girls did that themselves, you know, and, the, and on the men's team, it was, it was the same way talking to their coaches, you know, they were responsible for the mindset and the psyche and the direction of the squad. And if they didn't fall in line, they sorted it out on both ends. So, um, and I know that like, I've, I've kind of seen this type of movement as well in, in the men. Like, so I'm not just saying this is just the women, right? I think it's just the generation as a whole. I think needs to, if, if you're going to be a successful coach with, with juniors moving through it into around that 19, 20, 21 year old age, you really need to be hands-on with every single aspect of, of their persona in the sport, you know? There's a lot, so, of, a lot of coddling, a lot of yeah. you know, heavy handedness at times. And it's, and it's not, and it's not, it's not the worst situation to be in. I think like that's, a solid position for anybody that's a coach to, to kind of dive into and get a lot out of it. And they will. Um, I just think for me right now with um, having a young family and just the stress of, I used, I used to just lay down and, and just unload the stress of the coaching week with my wife. And I'm just like, I can't, that's I can't fair, do this right? anymore. It's too much. You know, like I need, I need to work with some self-motivated athletes. Yeah. And I think that, unless you're coaching maybe at higher levels in, in junior rugby or junior anything these days, you might not get that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tough. And it, yeah, if it's wearing you out like that, it's, it's, you gotta, you gotta give yourself a break. Right. So, you know, bravo for your wife for sticking through that and uh, <laughs> good on you for recognizing it, that it was, it was, it, was, it sounds like it was eating you up pretty hard. So. Well, yeah, just, this is like a shrink session here. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I do I do a lot of counseling. I'm not a counselor, but I do a lot at yeah. my school. <laughs> All right. So Derek, let's jump into the uh let's jump into the quick fire section. Let's shift it up a little bit here. You're you're a little bit familiar. Um so uh we got about 20 questions or so. You said you've listened to a couple of pods, you know some of the questions. So let's see how let's see how you do. You ready to give it a go? Yeah, let's do it. All right, Derek, what's the who's the best team you've ever faced? Oh, um I'd say probably in sevens, I'm going to say with South Africa, um, kind of 2004, 2005 ish. Um, too many crazy speedy guys, just super skilled. Was, it, um, was Brian Abana playing the sevens then? Uh, no, he was. He was just out. Oh. <laughs> um, but like they had, they had some super scary speed all over the field, just kind of like they do now, I guess. But like, um, it seemed like even their even their big fast guys were big fast prop fast guys. You know, like. Fast is always the key key word in most of these teams. Um, so yeah, that they were solid. And I think in 15s, I'd probably have to go with uh, England when we got pumped in uh, at Twickenham. I think it was like 70 something to nothing or whatever. It was pretty hard trouncing. Uh, Jason Robinson was playing fullback, and it was his first game as captain, I think, if I recall. And yeah, it was a long day. I was playing fullback. That was near the end of my fullback experiment. Um, maybe that game kind of helped it to kind of go away <laughs> a little faster. Um, yeah, so and that was also a, a good uh, – Cudmore even wrote about it in his, in his memoirs here, but the backwards kick for touch was in that game um, from a penalty. We, we were right in front of the post. Uh, no time hardly left. Uh, we had time for a line out. It was like right on the 22. And uh, the whole crowd thought we were going to bring a tee on the field for sure, right? So uh, lined up for the corner and, you know, whatever the crowd, it was full that day because I think they had like the two for one deal or whatever they gave out to make sure the crowd was packed in that day. And they all cheered really, really hard. And I pumped it to the, to the corner and it kind of shanked off the side of my boot and went straight sideways. Uh, and I, you know, they like to say it went backwards, but I think it was like maybe like half a foot forward on the 22. Let's say. <laughs> but I, after the game, Sluggo was really ripping me and I was like, Hey man, I found touch. <laughs> I'm going to have to look that one up on YouTube. 
right. Who's the Derek? Who's the toughest? Uh, sorry, who's the best player you've ever faced? Best player I've ever faced. Oh, there's so many. It's hard to pick one. Um, like I said, Jason Robinson was was quite scary. Uh, Lottie Takiri, I think it was. If I'd had to, had to pick one, just too big, too fast, too. You could hear him run. You know, these guys are so huge. When they're when they're running, they make noise like a horse going by. You know, like it's just <laughs> just so so good and so fast and big. So I think like he was he was probably one of them. And you know, I gotta say Sarevi for sure. Playing against a guy like that. Um, There's one time actually at the uh, at the Commonwealth Games we played them, and uh, I had him lined up really well and he didn't see me coming and I was going full out and I'm thinking to myself like I'm gonna end his career here like he has no idea I'm here like he's literally gonna die and that was kind of like one of my specialties back then is just teeing off on guys on on the angle um in their blind spots and I launched myself and he, he didn't look at me at all the whole time and I don't know if he saw me in the jumbotron or something but like he <laughs> When I was airborne, I was about probably maybe two and a half feet off the ground, three max, and he ducked under me. And I flew right over his back. There's a, I have a picture of it. It's insane. And just took off running the other way. And I was just like, what? Did he just teleport? Like, this is insane. <laughs> like, I literally thought I was going to kill him. I thought he was done. I thought I was like, this is, they're going to, the whole world is going to hate me for descending this guy's life right now. But you yeah, he, was just, he was that good. You need yeah. to send me that picture. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, I need to see that. Totally insane. All right. Who's the toughest player you ever faced? And when I say that, I, I mean the guy that they have the ball, it's a 1v1, and you're just praying that he trips or somebody yeah, throws so him from the crowd. Or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with uh, Kevin Wachowski. Lunk is his, what he goes by out, out west. He was just suited up for Belox, I think, one, one game when I was at the Pride. And he was just, he still is just a huge tank. And I, I put myself up against anybody in a tackle. You know, I had confidence that I would at least if I got blown up, whatever. Right. And I got low and sunk in and gave him my best and went right at him. And Holy cow, was it just, I just literally got run over by a truck. Like it was the biggest flattening I've ever had trying to hit anybody in my life. And I could not believe the stature of that man. It's, it's a, it was mind blowing. I've never experienced anything like it ever again in, in international anything. Yeah, that's a good shout then. Yeah. All right. Uh, sevens or fifteens? Oh man. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go with fifteens. Good. Just for the impact personally, I think I can have on a game. Yeah. Whereas sevens, I'm more of like, you know, kind of the guy at the bottom of a ruck every time digging balls out, making, you know, as many tackles and passing the ball off to the last two guys that are actually going to score. Right. Fair enough. Primarily probably like, I don't have the speed to get it done in that game maybe, <laughs> but um, yeah. in 15s, I think I just enjoy the, the dynamic of a, a lot larger numbers of guys on the team. Um, you know, the, the game plans are, you know, a lot more in depth. Um, it's just there's so many variables in a in a game of fifteens that kind of make you fall in love with it. I think you're right. I think you're right. So if you take a look right now, Derek has a Team Canada hat on, and stupid me, I, I scheduled this during the World Juniors, and <laughs> Canada and Switzerland are playing, and uh, the game's over right now. Derek, do you want to know the score? Sure, lad. Let me have it. Ten nothing, Canada. Nice. So they, uh, they, they kind of rebounded. It was a little tight earlier than that. But uh, my question is, World Juniors or Stanley Cup playoffs? Oh, World Juniors, for sure. Yeah. Who's your team? By, by Who's your by. NHL team? Toronto. So yeah. same as me. So it's World Juniors because Toronto doesn't get out of the first round anymore. Yeah, true. But um, I think, like, just the buildup to, to the World Juniors, like, is kind of like a holiday – festival kind of experience for families i think at that time of year christmas um it gives you something to look forward to after christmas even that's yeah. going to take you into the new year and uh, i don't think the toronto maple leafs 
unite a country fully as much as the world juniors do. I think that's where, fair. Where we obviously we have fans spread out across the country, but it's just not it's not a unifying event so much as you know uh, Max Domi lighting it up in Montreal and all those guys loving him and yeah. you know him playing there one day again. You know, it's just like so. It's yeah, you just everybody loves the kids. I think everybody's in awe of how good they are at that age. And it's just uh, to see them performing at, at their best, you know, with the Canadian jersey on, I think just makes everybody smile inside. I couldn't agree. That's, that's, uh, I couldn't agree more. I think that's, that's a pretty fair statement. All right, back to rugby. What's your favorite rugby tradition? Uh, I think the, the sing songs on the bus, I think. It's one oh, of my okay. favorite ones. Um, well, what's a good song that you remember? <laughs> this goes back to like even NA four days. We, there, uh, I don't know if you remember Mike Webb, but um, he was playing for the East in the NA4. And we used to sing a lot of John Mayer on the bus in little duets together. So that was always fun. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it's, all, it's always interesting to kind of see who's going to kind of bring what kind of dynamic to the table beyond rugby. Yeah. And, and he was always good for, <laughs> for a sing song. And I, I, I like to join in. So. All right. uh, your your body is a wonderland was one of our favorites. All right, so here's the deal: <laughs> if a favorite rugby tradition has anything to do with song, the guest is required to sing part of a song. So we need to hear nice. a little bit of your body is a wonderland. Let's, let's so let's hear. It. It. So uh, <clears throat> we'll just go straight to the chorus. All right, you go right ahead. Your, your body is a wonderland. Your body is a wonderland. I use my hands. Your body is a wonderland. Something about the way the hair falls in your face. And we'd be looking at each other too and make eye contact, if, you know, make sure that we were really into it. And we'd call each other out if we weren't. And the, and awesome. the boys, the fans, I should say, on the bus. That's loved right. It. Loved Signing it. autographs for the boys yeah. after, eh? Loved it. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's, uh, what's your rugby nickname? Um, Pucker, I think, is just universal for me, for me yeah. across the board. But um, in sevens back in the day, Sluggo nicknamed me Mayo from officer and a gentleman i think because i showed up with some haircut that he thought was interesting one day okay and uh uh he just started calling me mayo and i and he, the running joke was every single time he he'd call me mayo he'd be like you watch that movie yet pucker or mayo and i'd be like no i haven't seen it and i just out of spite i would never watch it so i still haven't watched it you know god rest his soul i just never will i think out of respect for sluggo you know so i just it's a movie I'm never going to see. No, you should, you should do it now just, you know, to pay some respect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I, I think he'd get more out of the joke continuing. <laughs> <laughs> who's the, Derek, who's the player you'd love, you'd love to smash. Who's the, you look up, you just salivate and ready to crack this guy. Oh, whoever's lipping off the most. Usually the nine then, right? Yeah. Who, whoever it is, whoever <laughs> like gets me out of just like being on, you know, just, autopilot rugby guy that to like focus only on you now for the rest of the game whoever that guy is yeah all right any rugby superstitions <laughs> um you know what i tried to weed a lot of them out because i thought they were more problematic than anything to tell you the truth um I'm, I'm not sure if you know much about my history but i've had quite a dark history at times too mentally um in and just believing in myself and i had to uh I guess relearn what mental toughness was altogether and I think all these superstitions and kind of stipulations and this and that really were like you know not a huge part of my problem but I definitely made sure not to include them in my game at all so um for me I think if you could add a superstition it would just be like staying calm totally before any match and if anybody tries to you know rile up a team that I might have some sort of leadership over with uh like-minded individuals we'd kind of rile it down so that's maybe a superstition just keeping things calm as possible to the point where maybe we're like maybe a little too calm but it seemed to work out for us uh, during all those blues days so well, that's not bad I like that's a good one that's a, that seems to be a good one to have it's real team centered and and keeps everybody kind of focused more than anything right oh yeah some funny stories of, of just about that alone uh coaches coming in like getting all riled up like silver would come in and you know blah 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 blah. we're gonna throw the kitchen sink at him but he'd get the words messed up and he'd call it the chicken sink and we just <laughs> everyone's yelling and then he'd leave and then you'd have a couple of new young guys on the squad 
and they'd be like, yeah, and like slamming the walls and like Barkwell and me and a couple of other guys just looking at him, like settling, like yeah. everybody be quiet for a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then after a minute goes by, it's just like super dead still. And it's like, all right, are we, are we all chilled out now? Is everybody okay? <laughs> so it's funny. That's a good Co- Coach is trying to fire you up and the team's trying to fire you down. Yeah. It's, one of them's counterproductive. I'm not sure which one. <laughs> it might well. Yeah. When you hear chicken sink, though, that would, uh, I'd probably yeah, lose We're going to throw the chicken sink at these guys. <laughs> All right. So, Derek, did you watch the uh, documentary, The Last Dance, Michael Jordan documentary? I've seen uh, most of it. haven't finished it. Okay. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's great. All right. So, tell me, in your opinion, <clears throat> of the players you've played with, who was the Jordan, who was the Pippin, and who was the Rodman? Oh, man. You can call on yourself as one of these as well. <laughs> yeah. Nobody uh, has yet, but you can Jeez. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd probably have to go with Cuddles as the Rodman. Back if I had ever had a Rodman, he was always ready to rock, you know, definitely yep. could use a little bit of, of settling at times, but I I definitely wasn't the first one to be like, hey, uh, you know, like you, there's certain guys that you want riled up and certain guys that you don't. And I think like guys like that, you kind of just let them do what they want. A couple, they a couple of guys have mentioned Cudmore for Rodman too. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jordan would be more like a, I don't know, maybe like Andrew Monroe, a guy like that, maybe okay. like just a, just a calm guy that's, you know, got a sweet accent that's dialed into details and <laughs> wants to, wants to be like uh, on point with his skills, you know, yeah. maybe. And, and then, uh, geez, I couldn't tell you, tell you who, who Pippen would be, but it's beyond me. Probably a fair amount of them. Yeah. <laughs> All right, who are who are three that you would take on a golfing trip, weekend golfing trip? Could be teammates, it could be famous people, it could be dead alive. Any well, three you'd like to take? I definitely would have to take Ryan Smith because he's he's an avid golfer, and I just I, I like the banter that me and him have. And every time he calls me, I say hello, Ryan. Like, hello, <laughs> Derek. A little like Seinfeld. Seinfeld thing. Yeah. So, uh, but just out of anybody that I know plays rugby and loves golf, he he does. So I'd probably take him. Obviously, I'd take a guy like Wayne Gretzky, and uh, you know, maybe. Uh, you got to take somebody now. Like Gol- Gretzky's got like a two handicap or something. Sounds like Ryan's a different decent golfer. Do you have to take somebody that sucks at golf or? Well, I, you- I think I was going to take someone like maybe like Mila Kunitz. Oh, yeah. You know, just to kind of. Why not? Way too much, you know terribleness in this squad already <laughs> we just need to lighten it up a bit with you know probably she's probably a better golfer than everybody so <laughs> i have no idea but probably potentially yeah, yeah so right yeah. Uh, just a little yin and yang there right that's right yeah, yeah. <laughs> mix it up yeah. what's the most used app on your phone oh you're a tiktok guy aren't you you're making dances no i don't i don't have tiktok i don't uh, have tiktok that's but good. uh I like YouTube a lot. I like fishing videos on YouTube. All right. And there's a lot of fishing videos. Yeah. Um, right now, the big one is like seeing how thick the ice is on Lake Nivising. <laughs> so yeah, this is where we're at right now. Yeah, I don't know. COVID times, right? <laughs> right. All right. What's your go-to food? I like uh, curries right now. Curry? Making a lot of curries and stir fries kind of okay. over rice is kind of my go-to. All right. I, I'm down like probably like 35 pounds from a peak I had, a, you know, a few years back. Um, so good for you. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm under my weight now where, when I was at the world cup in 07. So this wow. is like, this is huge for me. Well, it's not huge for me actually, it's <laughs> small for me. but um, well, the 35 pounds you lost migrated East to me. And I think yeah, I there you go. 35, so, so. so try to keep my gut healthy and the food kind of, I guess, puts you in that direction. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> all right so the the next couple might you might not answer then chips or cookies uh chips for sure yeah what kind chips. of chips i like personally the ruffle sour cream and bacon oh that's but, a first um old dutch has the best all dress chips going i believe yeah i do like personally. old dutch yeah and if you're gonna go healthy you gotta go for the i think it's not Miss Vicky's maybe, but there's a there's a kettle cooked with avocado oil. Oh really? Yeah, it sounds like Miss Vicky's. Like, 
maybe a lid off there. Yeah. So that's like when you're when you're not trying to like go full yard sale on the chips. <laughs> still, still hit it. <laughs> All right. What's uh, what about French fries or onion rings? Um, I'll I'll take a toss up on that at most times, but I'll go onion rings just straight up if it's straight up French fries. But if you hit me with a poutine, I'm gonna go with poutine. All yeah. right. Nice. Yeah. What's your favorite beer? Ch- cheap stuff usually, like. <laughs> bush <laughs> out west lucky Jeez. lucky's good but yeah i like bush because it's it actually doesn't taste that bad um and if i'm really going to treat myself i'll go with a 50 wow yeah <laughs> all right and if, I, the... and if i actually had to choose what i want it's going to be a 50 probably all right if money wasn't an object what would you drink 50 50 okay yeah. <laughs> what's uh what's the best place for a post-match beer uh I've heard this many times and they're not wrong, but definitely in the sheds for sure. Yeah. 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 It's just uh, the, the conversations kind of take their road wherever they're going to go. And guys are in and out of, you know, t- talking to this guy, swapping shirts over here. It's just like a free for all. Right. So yeah. you kind of get to meander your way into conversations that you'd like to have with certain guys that, you know, um, that's great. Yeah. Sheds are perfect. What's a guilty pleasure? Uh, probably ice cream. If I'm gonna hit it up, yeah. Okay. What Love like ice cream? Specific flavor or anything? No, anything's good. Yeah, <laughs> anything. Right. Nothing fruity. Yeah. Yeah. Get your chocolates, your caramels, your fudges. Some peanut butter in there. Yeah, all that peanut butter yeah. is always a staple. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Love the ice cream. I can, it's my vex. I got to stay off the ice cream. <laughs> How are you I, down? Could, I could damage a tub easy. Yeah. How are you down 35 with it's chips? Because it's not in my cream. house. It's not in my house anymore. God bless my wife. Yeah. But yeah, it's bad right. stuff, man. It's bad. Yeah, but it's so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. What's, uh, what's your favorite song or your favorite band, something like that? So this, this is going to go on a totally different tangent here, but I'm, I'm an electronic DJ. So oh, I went wow. to like house and techno and progressive and stuff like that, right? So Give yourself I started, a little plug here, all right? Yeah, so I started DJing back in 98. Um, and then when I moved out west, I got involved with one of the nightclubs out there. So I was DJing at a, at a nightclub and I started traveling up and down the island, headlining at some clubs when I was playing rugby out there. So um, for me, it's Eric Prids is like probably my favorite producer dj i guess eric prids eric prids yeah you remember that calling me remix that came out a while back he did that one like call on me call me call on me. Uh, okay so yeah, it was yeah. all over the radio so kind of a funny story about that one like he he was already really well known for good productions like kind of in the more of the underground scene but just to make a point he made that song to kind of prove that everybody would know him after he made it and everyone did and he was this big star worldwide and it was kind of like a running inside joke i think on on that track so uh yeah just for me i just love kind of like deep house like melodic stuff like very musical type like and juna deep is like a good label that i'm into so yeah right now a lot of your listeners are like what the heck is he talking about i am i'm I'm trying to keep up listen to some and juna deep you'll love it so do you get like like do you dj at like dances or parties so mostly it was like nightclubs and club night gigs that i started myself or went as like uh you know, on the, on the card or whatever. So, um, I, I was doing some house parties here and there, or like Halloween parties or whatever, but, um, for sure we'll never do again is like a wedding. Cause I, I did that as a favor to some people at times. And there's certain, certain niches in, in music that I won't go anymore, but yeah. So yeah. It's just, yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> or just, uh, anybody that comes to the dj booth <laughs> requesting anything that's why they have those pieces of paper now because they don't want to talk to anybody they just like write down your song and if i get to it i get to it that's i think that's probably say. fair <laughs> all right what series are you binge watching right now oh man we've been through quite a few lately we liked uh we really like the umbrella academy my wife and i were sat down and watched that yeah, that's good so we're waiting for another one but the mandalorian i think is kind of my favorite right now yeah um, and then caught up on that, those? That was a, yeah, it was a mind blowing finale there. Yeah. Just, that was good. I think it was just exactly how everybody wanted to see it, you know. Yeah. So yeah, I really enjoyed that. I'm not gonna spoil that for anybody. Oh, go ahead. No way. <laughs> no way. <laughs> What's your favorite movie? 
probably go with Dumb and Dumber. Just classic. Too yeah, too classic, too funny. Just Cam Neely cameo, like so so many things you missed too that you got to watch again and find and yeah, just love that movie. All right, yeah. so three questions left. You I, probably, I can't leave out Top Gun though as like a close second. Are you looking forward to the remake oh, or the second? Yeah, you, I believe, like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's epic. Who would play you in the Netflix movie of your life? The gears are grinding in there. I, I can hear them. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not because I'm I'm not funny. I'm not too serious. I'm not so like who's the most average actor you can think of. Like I've that, been la- that, I've been laughing through it this yeah. entire talk here. <laughs> Be like, uh, <laughs> let's go with um, let's go with Bill Murray. That'd be funny. Ah, nice. Yeah. An old an old Bill Murray. An old Bill with, Murray with makeup playing a young me. <laughs> Right. <laughs> who would play the leading lady now oh, we, gotta, I, we gotta go back to myla kunitz again all right yeah, or mila what yeah what one of them mila, mila, mila. yeah whatever i'll works. call her whatever she wants me to call her That's right. <laughs> all right what would the movie be called uh <laughs> like puck off or something like that yeah i don't know <laughs> call it uh, a movie about a guy who's the best DJ in the world that thought he was a rugby player who thought he was a hockey player. That's a handful. <laughs> like He's it. not a very good DJ either, probably. <laughs> I like it. That's in the footnotes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for those. We'll only get a couple but of But I am a better then. DJ than a hockey player or a rugby player. <laughs> <laughs> you get a website, like where can we direct traffic I, to? No, you know what? I think I have some mixes on, uh, on Mixcloud under Puck. Okay. Um, but I think I'm on also on uh, YouTube. I've got a couple on YouTube uh, under Puck Music. I think is my my handle. I'll get you to send me the link, and I'll uh, I'll see if I can add some yeah, of the sure. music into the. Uh, into I think this. it's Audio Gasm Three. I think is on there. That's <laughs> what it's called. Audio Gasm. Audio Gasm. Yeah. All right. It's a better self-explanatory be title. It better be good. <laughs> <laughs> Set myself up for failure with that title. Yeah. That could be the name of your movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So just a couple of questions left here, Derek. Um, back to the kind of serious ones. Who had the biggest impact on you as a player? I'm going to probably say my teammates. Because there's, there's been a lot of very good examples that I've been around of where your mindset should be, where, what your training should be like, you know, what your diet should be like even, which is something that I faltered on for sure in a lot of my career. Like there was some, some very elite examples across the board, I think. And I don't think you need to look any further than people actually living it when, you, when that's what you want to be. And I don't think you'll ever get that from a coach personally after being through all of it, looking back. Um, everything you, you needed as an example is always right in front of you, you know? So definitely my teammates. And then for sure, if I could lean on anything, which was like maybe just the mass failure that you need to succeed, I think is, was the biggest impact on me. I think when I look at like success in anything now, it looks like just a big mountain of failure with a gold sheet on it. Kind of, you know, that's kind of how I look at success now. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's where that t- kind of ties into what you're talking about with with uh, kids nowadays and mental skills and stuff. Not lear- not knowing how to fail and what failure can actually do for you throughout your life, how it can make you stronger, and how it can actually take you to being successful. Yep. So yeah, that's those, those are really some really good thoughts there, Derek. Next question. I, I think I know how you're going to answer this, but I want to hear from you. What are your thoughts on what makes a great team player? Yeah, I think like uh, it's, it's kind of like a two-parter, right? When you, you come into a team um, fresh, you kind of don't know how the team works. You don't know the dynamic of the, the team. You don't know how to fit yourself into the team. Um, and it's not until you grow in a team that you realize all the ways that you can help the team out. So like, and I think like even moving towards being a captain on a team, you're really just like the biggest servant on the team because you've learned all the ways to serve the team by that point. And so the, thus, you just get named captain because 
you know how to be the biggest servant, right? So I think like the best teammates are the biggest servants, like the ones that are completely selfless for the goals of the team. Because no matter what, as soon as you start to weed in any kind of negativity that's selfish, it destroys the team. It takes a brick out of the wall every single time, no matter what. I don't care how, how much you try to fix it. You just know in the back of your head that that went down. You know what I mean? Or whatever the situation was. So I think like um, getting a leadership group that is completely selfless, that elevates new people to a position of power kind of immediately, they might not have it, but at least like in their mind, they're welcome to that level. I think it makes the team click. And then in turn, you'll see those new guys kind of start to serve the team immediately because they have an example of it already. So I think that's the kind of biggest thing that makes a team successful is just being a servant to it and knowing that 100% of the time it's bigger than you, mm. no matter what. A you selfless break, servant. You can, break your, you can break your arm in training or whatever, or roll an ankle or whatever. At any given moment, whoever you think that the team is leaning on is, could be gone yeah. and snuffed out. For any reason right like so you, you have to have a team that um is firing on all cylinders no matter what cylinder that is even if it's the new guy that's 17 like a tay paris that comes into the team um you're not going to get the best out of a kid like that by letting him know that he's the new guy and he should be looking up to you and fall in line and you know all that crap that people would like to perpetuate as a positivity you know like you can get so much out of a young kid like that as a, as a veteran, just yeah. the, the youthful exuberance that you can play with, you know, all that stuff. So there's something to take from everybody. And I think that's what the blues kind of dynasty really understood was everyone has optimal value and you need to get it out of them immediately. And if you try to belittle anybody in any situation, it takes away from the fullest potential of that team and also takes away from the dynamic of the team. But transversely, all that positive energy now has value mm -hmm. as opposed to the negative value is very, very powerful. The, the positive value is also extremely powerful. So yeah, I, I love that. Like the selfless servant aspect, uh, the, the blues aspect, like everybody's, everybody's valuable. Uh, you know, I, I am automatically go to when, you know, New Zealand all blacks preach like no assholes allowed. And, you know, mm -hmm. if you are, if you're not buying into our team culture and our team community, then you're not welcome. Yep. That, that individualistic mindset doesn't fly on a rugby team. Yep. I think you summed that up very succinctly. That was really nice. That was really nice thoughts. Let's flash forward here. It's 2027, 20, seven years in the future, six years in the future. 20 years out from that 2007 World Cup team, you know, the, with Canada when you went to France. What do you want those guys to be saying about you? You're, you're mingling, you're having some beers, you've got some 50 there. What do you guys, what do you want those guys to be saying about you? I think like I'd, I'd like them to say that, you know, like I'd, I put them first. I, I played for, you know, more than just myself or my country. Like I played for the guys around me um i think too like there's more than just on the field i think off the field you need to be kind of productive to your teammates as well like it's you got to give back to to the relationship no matter what that is between you know the guys and i, I think like if they're if i was going to get anything out of it i think i'd hope that you know i was a i was a pleasure to kind of be around on and off the field and somebody that they could depend on, you know? I think that's, uh, I think that's great. I think that's all anybody could ask for. That's nice. All right. So Derek, you've got a few things on the go. You've got your, your mad DJ skills. <laughs> you've got, uh, you're working the karate dojo, aren't you as well? No. So yeah. So I quit, uh, at about 20 when I went out West, that was the end of it for me. Okay. Um, but my dad and my brother, uh, have been running my brother took over probably around maybe 20 years ago now he took over from my dad okay but my dad's still kind of he's you know the you know the, the guy that you pay homage to when you bow in the, in the nice. dojo you know he's like the head sensei still but my brother runs it so I stopped doing karate when I went out west to play rugby and it's kind of interesting I did it for more than a decade which is plenty of time to get a black belt but I never did 
and it's because I was always in and out for other sports. So every time I came back, like if I was off for a year and I came back, my dad would make me wear a white belt. <laughs> and I didn't have to grade for yellow or, you know, green or orange or anything up the ranks. Yeah. Um, but when they kind of just thought I was able to wear it again, they would just like say, okay, you can wear your orange belt again. Now, like it's, it was a, it's a very traditional dojo. Yeah. Um, has roots in Japan and uh, like Leota Mashida in Brazil is in the same organization okay. as we are. So it's very traditional. Everything's done in Japanese and you know, it's, it's uh, you wear white gi, you don't do any somersaults and flips and stuff. It's very like traditional basics. Right. So it was always uh, far away from a black belt. So <laughs> I never just, I just never went back. I think, cause at some point I just kind of saw the writing on the wall is like, you know, this is, the way this is going, it's, this is going to be a very long time for me to get This there. is the way. And I have other irons in the fire, like obviously being a super sweet DJ and stuff like that. So <laughs> um, <laughs> I kind of had other focuses, but yeah, so, my daughter, my daughter goes there now. She's four. So, you know, it's, so awesome. we still stay involved. Yeah. So give a show, like what's the dojo called? Where can people find it? Like where can people sign up to go? Yeah. To so it's Day Puck Karate in London. Um, it's easy to find. It's, I think if you search it online too, it's, I think it's comes up right away. So yeah. That's awesome. Run, run by my brother, Pete and my dad, Reg. Nice. Yeah. All right. So I, I, I did find this and you're a firefighter, right? Yep. So, you know, I've had a few guys on that have gone into firefighting or, or training to go into firefighting when they're done. So John Seal tools, a firefighter, DTH took his training, stuff like that. What are your, like, why, why firefighting? What was the draw for you as a retired, you know, rugby national player to go into that, to go into that field? Yes. Like I know a lot of guys kind of find the correlation between rugby and firefighting is a smooth transition and they're kind of yearning for that team environment. Still, for me, it goes back to being two, I think, or two and a half, maybe three. My uncle was staying with us for a bit and he would grab a smoke and, leave his lighter and his cigarette pack on the, on the counter or whatever. And I remember um, watching him and one time I got the lighter started cause it didn't, they weren't child safe at that point. Right. This is like 1981 or whatever, right? Like 1980. Um, I got the lighter started and I lit the mattress in the basement on fire. And my brother ran upstairs at the time he was four or five and couldn't talk. He was just kind of pointing downstairs. My mom came down and put out the sheet, smothered it. And I'll be damned if we weren't the most fire safe family in the universe after that. Um, the fire department didn't have to come. My mom was on it real quick. Um, so basically just had a hole in the, in the blanket on the, on the top of the bed. But within, you know, a few months from there, like even just like learning how to talk and stuff like that, I knew what a pole station was, fire trucks, firemen, you know, like escape routes, like, it was, uh, obviously, I'm sure it probably scared the living daylights out of my parents, right? Ba so, baptism by fire, so to yeah. speak. <laughs> so by the time I went into school in, in kindergarten, um, there was a bunch of kids collaborated outside a pull station in the hallway in, in the classroom, and they were talking about how candy was going to come out if they pulled it. Uh -huh. And I was like, no, that's a, that's a pull station. If you pull that, fire alarm's coming. Like, you pull that for a fire. They're like, no, 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 candy's coming out. And they started to prop each other up. And I was just about walking to go. To, this is the first time I was going to rat somebody out. Probably, probably not. I ratted my sister out a lot before that. Probably. <laughs> but I was about to go tell the teacher and I took two or three steps. And uh, sure enough, the fire alarm went off and the fire department came in because they knew where it was. It was our pole station. And had a good talking to the kids. And I was just in awe, like, oh, there, there they are. You know, these are the, they're the real deal, right? So um, I kind of all, always had it in my mind that I wanted to do it. And then it's kind of weird how it all worked out through rugby and getting carded. I was able to get my school paid for. And it was more or less just buying time to, to be at the point in my life where I could go to school. And then the bonus was getting it paid for too. Yeah. So um, hats off to rugby, you know, giving back to me again. It seems to be like a lot of take from the sport and not a lot of give, you know, like you get <laughs> way more out of it than you could ever put back into it, you know? So um <clears throat> Is even as if you try hard to to make it even you never will you know so <laughs> yeah so that's kind of where, where, where what happened for me and uh yeah i was super lucky to get on obviously like just every day i'm there and so fortunate to see my name on the board you know yeah i mean well london's a fairly large town it was a few hundred thousand there right so yeah i so imagine I actually, you're busy i didn't get on london i got on hamilton 
Okay. Um, I tried to get on London, got to the interview process, and uh, it had a long history of hiring full timers from other departments, like kind of when I was going through. Um, so I thought it would be a little tough getting in there, and it, it did prove to be. But Hamilton took me on, and I told London, you know, like if I get on somewhere else, you'll never see me again. And the rest is history. So I'm happy there. I got a good family up there, with my brothers and sisters in Hamilton, and um, it's a great city to firefight in with, you know, the escarpment and I'm on a rope team there too. So it's, uh, you got the, the lakes, you know, the highways, there's a, a lot of old buildings there. Yeah. Um, I've never been city, to Hamilton. Yeah. yeah. Good, good blue collar city to, yeah. to work. In. So how you're living in London. So what, what, what are your shifts like? What's that commute like? Things like that. Yeah, so we're on 24s. We're on the Toronto schedule, I guess you'd call it, where um, it's like intermittent uh, 24 hour shifts. And then uh, the most that you'll have back to back is a Friday, Sunday shift. Okay. So you'll have one day off in between. So we get, um, we get a break before we have to, like, we're not up there for like three days in a row. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, so like the, the back and forth is, is kind of intense, but it's at the right time. So, when I leave for work, it's quarter after five in the morning. And when I come home, it's, you know, I just kind of take my time getting home. And when I get home, I get home. I don't, I don't have to sweat it on the way home because I don't have to be home for any, anything really except to drive kids to school or whatever. But yeah. my wife's so good with me, you know, if I'm delayed with traffic or whatever, she always takes care of business. So it's great to have her as a support. And on the way there, you get some time to yourself listening, you know, you know, the Canadian ruck or whatever you want to throw on and, you know, some, some house music or whatever. And that's right. Have some time to yourself. Right. So appreciate yeah. that. How long is, what, how long of a drive is that? A couple it's hours? About an hour and 15. Oh, okay. That's not yeah. too, too bad. It's not bad. And I think the guys coming from Toronto have just as much of a commute there, you know, and it's kind of the, the, where we live in with uh, work these days, a lot of people commute long distances and I don't think I'm, I'm one of the furthest ones. So I'm yeah. just fortunate to be up there. Yeah. That's good. That's awesome. La- lastly, Derek, any great rugby stories you can share with us? Hey, throw, you said earlier you don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but this is the time where you can. <laughs> you know what? I I would never throw throw anyone under the bus under like a lasting negative impression on somebody. But we had there's definitely some some really funny stories through the sevens. And um, one thing that stuck out for me the other day, I was thinking about was uh, training in the in the hot desert in Dubai, and uh, the guys were quite quite spent after the two days, you know, and uh, Sluggo had thrown it out there to that if, if Disco Danskin kicked uh, 15 in a row, uh, we wouldn't have to train in the afternoon. So he starts firing him uh, balls from all over the place and Disco just starts pounding these balls <laughs> through the uprights. And he gets to nine, he gets to 10, he gets to 11. We're just losing it, like 12. And he knocked every single one through and we had the afternoon off, so that was great. We got out of a, a training session in the afternoon that maybe we probably needed, but um, awesome. <laughs> just, uh, it's, it's times like that. I just think like in a daydream driving or to work or whatever, I have a little chuckle to myself about good times like that. Um, uh, one time uh, on tour that you could hear the Fijians doing their, their morning service on tour every, every morning they get up at the crack of dawn and they sing in those beautiful harmonies. I'm not sure if you've ever heard them or not, but when they get going, it's something special and you could hear it all the way through the hallways. And I had come uh, pretty good friends with a guy named Sorelli Nengalavuki. And uh, we kind of were at the point now where on tours, we kind of exchange gifts here and there. Like he would bring me a sarong and I'd bring him like maple syrup or, you know, like stuff like that. So it doesn't seem fair for him. (laughs) (laughs) I know. (laughs) But uh, so, uh, one night he invited me out to he's like you know if you if you ever get up in the morning come out to the service you know in the morning so i was like yeah yeah so i heard them singing one morning and i got up and walked down there and holy cow did they just treat me like a king in there like just what it was like walking into a big family reunion with a bunch of your relatives that you didn't know oh beautiful and uh Surabi was running the session and then they had their their prayers and they start speaking in in fijian and and he was just going off for about five or 10 minutes on this prayer. And I'm kind of just like, I don't understand anything. They're saying. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, right in the middle of it, it's like, uh, you know, blah, 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 Mr. Pucker, blah, blah, Canada, Mr. Pucker, blah, 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 Mr. Pucker, blah, blah. And like, it was just, it kind of made the world really small at one point for me. And it, you, you got to take a step back on what you get out of the sport 
and for me like that's always a memory that I'll look back on is like like the time Surevi was like lifting me up in prayer in Fijian you know like it's just it's mind-blowing to like see how much these guys cared about each other off the field yeah and then the rugby on the field maybe that's a testament to how they play together you know oh, that's a beautiful just how story. tight they are so yeah uh that was great um yeah it's just I you could talk to any one of us and we'll just probably could go on and on for a couple hours of just awesome stories you know throughout the years but <laughs> things like that kind of stick out in my memory um one another one is uh just sluggo trying to work, get the team to work cohesively always had us do skits so uh when we were on tour he'd break us up into groups and we had our skit group and holy cow are those some fun times and we just would, would laugh so hard and uh those really brought the team together i think on on tour and um it's one thing i i kind of you, you wish you could per perpetuate if you if you were ever head of a team that toured a lot in the future i think i might bring that in because it yeah. was really fun and um yeah that's awesome well listen derek i really appreciate your time uh i've had a, i've had a great time you said you're not funny but i i disagree with you <laughs> wholeheartedly i've laughed quite a lot here over the last hour or so so i really appreciate it listen uh, i wish you nothing but the best of luck and success with your family with your firefighting you know keeping COVID at bay there in london and uh just you know hopefully 2021 is a great year for you yeah well, thanks for having me i really appreciate it it's uh it's it's good to reminisce like this and kind of think about yesteryears and days gone by that are never coming back again <laughs> unless, unless you go to classics in Bermuda, which i've been a part of for a while but um it gives you a little taste of it but definitely talking about all these old stories has kind of brought it back to the surface so that's good thanks for that no worries appreciate it and all the best appreciate it. i've had a pleasure cheers bud have a good night all right <laughs> thanks a lot derek man that was a that was a good conversation a uh, great chatting rugby and uh, just sharing general love of the game so thanks very much derek it was a blast having you on listen uh keep yourself safe thank you for your tireless effort as a firefighter in the city of hamilton uh, i'm sure the city appreciates all you do there and uh, just stay safe during COVID and stay safe while you're on the job. It's, it was a pleasure to have you on and maybe we'll get a chance to chat with you later on. Anyway, coming up soon, we have Maria Gallo. We have Kelly McCollum and Leslie McKenzie. Following that, we have Evan Olmstead, And then we have Marissa Pache. And Nick Blevins is on tap, Stephanie White and Hans de Goody, plus a host of others. If you have anybody else that you would like to hear from, please let me know and I'll do my best to contact them. Um, so far, pretty much anybody who I ask that wants to share their story loves to get on. And it's great because I know all of you that are listening or watching love to hear their story. So if you have anybody you want to hear from, just let us know. So thank you. Uh, I want to thank everybody that listens, that follows. Uh, be sure to keep spreading the rugby word. Retweet, reshare, repost. Uh, leave some comments, leave feedback, what have you. It's always great. And that way, these, these top-notch athletes and administrators know that how much we appreciate them in here in Canada. Uh, as always, i got to thank my son, Rylan, for uh, creating the uh, digital tunes that we use for our intro and outro. Uh, I've said it a couple times, Rylan's 12, and in his music class, they have a program where they can create music. So he asked one day if he could uh, create some music for the Canadian Rock, and I said, absolutely. So that's, that's his uh, little mastermind pieces of gem that you hear at the start of the pod and at the end of the pod. So thanks very much, Rylan. Uh, as I stated, as always, feel free to request topics for future podcasts, different guests. If you have questions you want me to ask, make sure you reach out. But as always, got to sign off. It's been a pleasure as always. So again, this is Jamie. Until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane, and most importantly, keep on rocking. Mm -hmm.